Welcome to Overcome America Hair Loss Summit. My name is Valerie Fuentes. I'm your host, and today I am with Dr. Christina Gorbatanka Roth, who's a licensed psychologist interested in the interface of psychology and dermatology. She received her PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Iowa and is a professor of psychology at the University of Wisconsin Stout with an active research program in psychodermatology. And I am so happy to have you here today because your research is actually what fascinates me and the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing, which is to support everyone that's going through this journey of medical hair loss. So thank you so much for accepting my invitation. You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about you. How did you get into this field? Yes. Okay. So an interesting story. So I went to graduate school because I was very interested in how people cope with their health conditions. And I was not a patient at the time. I didn't have any health conditions. And I'd worked in multiple different um, settings, integrated into clinics as a health psychologist. However, all of a sudden I became a a patient and started losing my own hair. And I'm sitting in a dermatology clinic and experiencing all those things that you experience when your hair starts to fall out. And I was just thinking to myself, where are the psychologists? How come there's nobody dealing with the mental health aspect of this, the psychosocial consequences of this? So I had the unique perspective of being a health psychologist and then becoming a patient second after that. And so ever since that time, it's really focused what I've been doing in my research and and, um, my clinical work. So it's, it's been a blessing in many ways. I get it. And so tell us, just so we understand, what Mm -hmm. exactly is psychodermatology? Yeah, good question. So psychodermatology, the easiest way to explain it is the interface of psychology, psychiatry, and dermatology. And psychodermatological conditions, basically, um, there's multiple different ways you can categorize them. But one way are conditions that, because you have a condition, it impacts your cycle. The consequences of your condition, it impacts your psychology, your psychological functioning, Mm -hmm. um, your psychosocial Um, You might be experiencing distress like that, and it might start um, interfering with your ability to function in your life. So that's one area of psychodermatology. There's another area of psychodermatology that looks also as how do psychological factors cause dermatological conditions. Um, And then there is other areas of psychodermatology as well, but really it's the interface of psychiatry, psychology, and dermatology. And my interest is mainly in the, I mean, I'm interested in it all, but my focus of research is more in the, how do the psych, what are the psychological consequences? What are the impacts of having a chronic disfiguring health condition? And what can you do to regain sort of some power, some sense of um, uh, control in your life when you have an uncontrollable skin condition or hair condition? Okay. And I am familiar with alopecia because I've experienced that myself. Right. Right. Are there any other conditions that you're studying closely besides alopecia? I personally am not studying them closely, but there's many other areas such as psoriasis, eczema, trichotillomania. Um, That's one where psychological, the latter one is one where the psychological factors are more causing um, the skin condition or the hair condition. But um, I'm interested in, in all conditions. Um, so sometimes psychodermatologists just study generally if we provide treatment in these other areas, what are the impacts versus other psychodermatologists will um, focus in a specific area. So for me, my research is actually focused mostly on alopecia, but I'm interested in the others as well. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So on that note, what, uh, what is known from research right now, uh, like, How's that coping? What are the coping mechanisms for alopecia? Sure, sure. Well, um, the coping mechanisms for alopecia, there's, let me step back and say in health psychology, there are three sort of general, well, there's lots of different ways that psychologists have tried to slice and dice and and research coping. Mm -hmm. Two major areas are what we would call avoidance coping, which is you avoid the condition You don't want to think about it. You don't want to be reminded of it. Um, You don't really do anything. You just want it to go away. So you do things to actively try to get it to go away. Mm -hmm. Then there's the other, the opposite of that is what we call approach coping, which is where you try to do things to address the problem. And you might address the problem through what we call problem-focused coping, which is you do something to actually change the situation. So Mm -hmm. 
Um, an example is you say, I'm going to change my diet. I'm going to try all these different treatments. I'm going to do these different things to, or I'm going to get a wig or whatever. I'm going to, but I'm going to, well, actually getting a wig isn't, would not be, would not fit in that category, but, um, you do things to try to fix the problem. Um, getting a wig, you are still trying, it depends on what the problem is. If, if, if the problem is you don't have hair and you don't want to be seen without hair, so you, and you feel more comfortable wearing a wig, then you're solving that problem by getting the wig, but you're not necessarily solving the alopecia, if that makes any sense. Then there's emotion-focused coping, which is you just deal with the negative emotions, but in a positive way. So you're experiencing these negative emotions due to having your alopecia, your skin condition, and there's things that you can do to help you process those negative emotions. Right. What I can tell you is avoidance coping across the board tends to not be very good for chronic health conditions. We know that across health conditions, we also see that for sure in alopecia areata. There's research out there to say that avoidance is, is really not healthy. In the short term, maybe, but in the long term, not really. Um, it's much more important to do what we call the approach coping. The problem with that is that a lot of people promote problem solving as like fix the problem. Well, in alopecia, you can't fix the problem because it's an uncontrollable skin condition that is, is um, you never know when it's gonna show up, when it's gonna get better, when it's gonna fall out again. Right. So it's more about acceptance. So, yes. you can, so now you can be active by working on acceptance, but that's what we would call emotion-focused coping. Yeah. So that was sort of, a, sorry about the little lecture there, but no, I love it. that's and what we know. You know, it sounds, uh, from what I'm hearing, it sounds almost what I experienced step by step. Yeah. So I started with, I don't, I don't have alopecia. Are you crazy? No way. I don't have mm -hmm. it. Right. Mm -hmm. So let me mm -hmm. go on another doctor. Right. Another right. Doctor, doctor. Until I finally was like, okay, so this is happening. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I tried everything under the sun to yep. make it go away. Or yep. make it hair. So yep. I spent years and you know, all my effort and energy and thoughts and all the things were around regrowing my hair. Right. Then after many heartbreaks and, uh, you know, just didn't work, mm -hmm. it was a really deep depression mm -hmm. um, where I did not, you know, you almost like quit everything. Yeah. Yeah. Then you get to a point or I get to a point where I was so disconnected almost from my you know my life or who I, or who I really am that I was like I had to make a choice of you either keep going downhill or you get to live and you're gonna shift yeah yeah yep. and and that's what happened so like from being at a point where I did not want anything I don't want to say that I was suicidal because I don't think I got that to that point sure sure but pretty close yeah yeah to, to say like, you know what, I'm going to live and I don't care. I'll get to live with this. Yep. yep. And, and that's when I started, you know, all my personal development, like really getting into like the psychological part of it because yep. I think it's both. Right. You can buy a wig all you want and you can get extensions, but if you don't work on your, on your mindset. Yeah. 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 You know? And the problem too, um, with just not working on that other stuff is for example, if you get a wig, you start to feel like you're hiding. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with, right. I mean, there's nothing wrong with wearing a wig. Like I was yeah. saying before, if you, if you can wear a wig and think of it as an accessory, you know, you can switch out your wigs, you can put them on, but if someone were to pull off that wig accidentally, or you were to run out in the door, someone comes to the door and they see you, you know, are you just frightful? Are you hiding? And, and is it keeping you from living your life versus saying, you know what, I'm going to wear a wig when it works. I'm not going to wear a wig when it doesn't. And really, um, you need to think about, are, is it decreasing your functioning? Is, and there's, there's some different questions that you can ask yourself to try to see, you know, am I getting to a, sort of a bad place with this where I need, I need to start working on it a little bit more? There's some mm -hmm. questions that you can ask yourself, you know, to, to figure out if you're at that place. But um, the thing just about wigs, again, I think wigs are great, but just, what you hear from many patients or people who have alopecia will say, sometimes they feel like the wig is a, um, it's a jail that they can't. Yeah. And a lot, and I've heard people say, I wish I could go out without it. 
wish I could do that. I wish I could be strong enough to do that. And it's not that one is better than the other. Again, I don't want anybody to think that. It's about what works for you. And are you feeling that fear? Because that you don't, nobody wants to live with that fear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I experienced that myself. So I've been wearing hair for five, five years, five and a okay. half years. Yeah. And at the beginning, I think that I definitely bought it to hide. Yeah, yeah. And, but it, I think with time and as I started sharing, you know, that I have alopecia and I started, you know, being open about it, Mm-hmm. that that fear went away but yeah. i was really hiding and the thing is that you don't even know you don't right. even know that this is hurting you you just yeah. wear your wig and you're happy because you look great and it's all awesome but like it stays with you that you're hiding and i didn't realize that until i started having conversations with my own clients where i'm telling them you know you get to connect with yourself and be authentic and do this and do that and then i'm thinking like you're not being authentic <laughs> why are you why are you even tell you how dare you tell this to somebody else and that's when I thought like you know what I can't do this I can't I can't not open be open about this when I'm telling other people to do so and that was it can I ask you what was did you have a sense of being like freed or freedom or was it freeing to start to tell people about it absolutely and I also I think or I couldn't like just I had to do it like one by one you know like all the important people in my life like one by one because sure. for the longest time only my parents mm-hmm. my doctor and my hairdresser knew yeah yeah because you right. also get and become an expert on camouflaging things yeah 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 yeah, so yeah. I was doing all the things and, and nobody a lot of people didn't know right um which is also stressful, right? Because you also feel, that was my biggest fear, honestly. Yeah. I, mm-hmm. I felt that everybody was gonna think that I'm a liar because I've been li- lying, quote unquote, about this for mm-hmm. over mm-hmm. time. Right, right, absolutely. And it takes so much courage to take that first step and to tell someone, Most of the time when I hear from clients or when I hear from other people in the community who have alopecia, once they do that, it's freeing and the response is usually positive if you've chosen the person correctly, you know, to whom you start disclosing this to. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it, it truly is like putting a heavy backpack off. You didn't even realize you were carrying it until you take it off and you're like, what a weight off your shoulders when you find Mm -hmm be able to talk to people which is another really interesting thing that we see in the research that you asked about coping so that not avoiding it and doing more approach coping and acceptance is extremely important we see that in the research we also see emotional social support having people there to whom you can vent having people there who understand having people there who um you can be yourself with them and that they know. And again, that's that, you know, that not hiding, but having people there is, is important. And another really thing important to know too, and I, again, I don't, I don't mean to be crying in your life with it, but that it's a, it's a continual up and down that some days you're like, this doesn't bother me. I'm fine. And other days you look in the mirror and you go, Oh my God, yeah, what, what is that? <laughs> that's not me. And yeah. so it's, it's, and that's normal and that's okay. Mm-hmm. It's, just, it's just, it goes. But it's really think, coming up, but there are always these little dips. Yeah, and like you have to, you really have to work on your on your mindset and mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. daily. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not something that goes away. I recently experienced. I went out with my hair for like three to four days, and first day I felt amazing. You know, I get to be me. People get yes. to see me just the yeah. way I am, and I was, you know, in cloud nine. And then the next day I woke up and what <laughs> you know like I got to see myself again and, and yeah like, maybe not <laughs> yeah 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 you know and so it I I really think that the like you said it's something that um, we get to work on forever mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. And, it, and it is to build our relationship with ourselves and make it stronger and stronger every day and right. I, you know that's my goal and that's also you know my purpose of and why I'm doing this is to show everyone that you know we don't have to stop our lives for this, mm-hmm. but we also get to work 
right? Like right. it's not, it's not one solution. Like it's not getting a wig and that's it. It's not, right. uh, you know, it, it's, it's a holistic approach. It's really, you have to right. do lots of different things. It's your environment, your community, who's around you, your support system. Like it's so many things that, you know, come into play when it comes to feeling well and having a good life when you're living with hair loss. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there was something else I was going to mention to you too. Oh, about treatment. You know, if for people, especially for alopecia, if they're continuing to see treatment, that's another tricky thing too, because there's what I would call the crash burn cycle. You get really hopeful that this is going to work and then you do it and then it doesn't work. And then sometimes you kind of go even lower than you were before you even started the treatment process. And so I just want people to really think about that. I mean, treatment is, is, is for many people, it's extremely helpful. It's mm -hmm. extremely helpful. But for other people, they get to the point where they're like, I've, I, I, you know, it's not working for me. And it's, it's almost more emotionally stressful to be going through treatment mm -hmm. and coming to that acceptance piece again of just going, you know, this is where I'm going to be right now. And maybe I'll go back and see treatment later. But right now, this is where I am. That sometimes people find that that's, that's a little bit easier. Absolutely. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because somebody asked me yesterday about, you know, the different treatments mm -hmm. that I tried. And yeah. what I share with her is, is that it's not even about the treat. It's not even the treatment what hurts or the time or anything. It's just that emotional roller coaster when you yes. when yes. you're so excited and you think that something's gonna work and you're putting all the efforts on it mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. it doesn't. And right. That's why I stopped because I don't want to go through it again. But, right, right, you know. right. But then also for some of us, uh, our alopecia is very cyclical and you never know what's going to happen. Like actually in the last four months, I've had a lot of regrowth mm -hmm. and it's been exciting. You know, yep. like I've cried of excitement sometimes because I'm thinking, oh my God, I healed myself. And then boom, all this yep. shit. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I had regrowth one time and then I started realizing the same thing. It's exciting. But then you start worrying about, is it falling out again? Is it going to fall out? Is it, you know, and is that a sign? And it just, I find it easier just staying the way that I am and just plugging along. So, so when do you think is a, is a good time to seek? Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a really good question. Okay. So first of all, most of the research in alopecia areata, um, it depends on the research study, of course, you have to get into the details of it. But most of the research indicates about 30 to 40% of patients might actually have a, diagno a clinically diagnosable depression or anxiety disorder. And anxiety disorders are actually more prevalent than the depression, depression disorders. Um, that said, if you look at other research, it'll say for health, about 85% of alopecia areata patients will say it has negatively impacted their life in some way. And it's those psychosocial impacts. So even though many of us will never get to have a clinical diagnosable clinical depression or anxiety disorder related to or secondary to our alopecia, most of us are going to experience some psychosocial consequences of that. But it's not clinical. So if you're trying to figure out, you know, do I need help? What should I do? Um, the first thing I would always say is um, I call them the four Ds. So it's uh, dysfunction, okay. deviance, distress, and danger. And I'll go through each of them in a minute. But if you're experiencing any of those four G, four Ds, you might want to just go talk to someone to just see how am I, you know. First of all, it never hurts anybody to go talk to someone, I think, from a, from a mental health perspective. Um, but those, to me, are sort of a barometer. So deviance basically are you well let, let's start with the easiest one distress are you experiencing a lot of emotional distress mm -hmm. that is and, and then does it become to the point that it's hard for you to function so dysfunction can you not get out of bed mm -hmm. are you not able to eat are you not able to do your job are you not able to maintain your relationships to do those normal things that you would be doing what's normal for you mm -hmm. if you're not able to do that because of your alopecia or because of your concern about your alopecia then it might be helpful to go talk to someone. And not that you have a depression, you'd be diagnosed with one or an anxiety disorder, but you might be able to find other ways to help you live better with it. Mm -hmm. 
barring your hair growing back, we can help you find ways. Psychologists can help you find ways to live better with your alopecia. Mm -hmm. um, deviance is, are you starting to do things that um, is deviant for you? Um, some, in, for the alopecia world, that's not as, as, as frequent as a, 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 an occurrence, like one of the four Ds. For example, someone with bipolar disorder, when they're in an active manic phase, they start do, potentially may start doing some deviant behavior, mm -hmm. but we don't normally see that with an alopecia areata. And then there's the danger. Are you what, starting to... What would you consider deviant behavior? Um, a deviant behavior might be going to class in a toga. Got it. Okay. If nobody else is, you know, what I mean? <laughs> or driving the driving really fast through town, or emptying your your uh, bank account to go buy sweaters that you're going to sell on the street, for the, you know, just things that are not what you normally would do, and in, in a, in a big shift from what, what your normal functioning is, and it's kind of deviant that other people look at it and go, that's a little unusual in a bad way, and it's not what you would normally do. That's more what I mean by deviant. Danger is one, you know, are you at risk to hurting yourself or to hurting someone else? Again, we don't typically see the latter one, but we might see people starting to say, as you were mentioning earlier, you know, it's not that I want to die, but this is really painful. This is really hard for me, and I don't know if I can keep doing this. Mm -hmm. So if anyone's experiencing that really high levels of that distress that is, and then that dysfunction or that danger, then I would say, go talk to someone and just go see how, you know, see how it's doing or see how you're doing. Also reach out to other people that emotional social support. And I'm going to make a shameless plug for NAF, <laughs> the National Alopecia Areata Foundation here. They are wonderful in helping people connect with a support group, a, a real community. And I would recommend anybody, I don't care how well you think you're doing with your alopecia, just sometime get to a NAF summer um, there's summer patient conference. There's wonderful information, but you're going to meet people and you just don't realize how cool it is to be in a room with a bunch of people with no hair that look just like you. You don't, with, even when you think that you're well adjusted, you realize I don't even have the secret. Like it's yeah. the weird people are the people with the hair in the room. So it's just a really, a really wonderful experience that I would highly recommend people to have. And again, you hear people, and I'm sure you've had people on who are going to talk about this, but you build relationships with people. You mm -hmm. build a community and it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the community support is, is huge uh, mm -hmm. because I think the first thing we tend to do in the beginning is hide. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. absolutely. We are, we are the only human with alopecia when right. there are right. 6.8 million Americans with alopecia, right? 140 something in the world. So there are so many of us but we all hide. Most of yeah. us hide. So yeah. it's yeah, yeah. I can't imagine just being. Um, I was, you know, sharing another interview that I, it's like meeting your long lost cousin. Just yeah. like you know, it has to feel like family, right? Right. Like they, right. Like we share the same thing. Well, it's really cool. In fact, it just an analogy is, or not even an analogy, just an experience. But when you're in the hotels, for example, and you, you get in the elevator, you know how normal if you get in the elevator and someone comes in, and if you don't, if you're not wearing your wig or if your hair, you're, um, you're going, you know, without a head covering, or even if you have a head covering, you kind of get that second look. It's yeah. the good, not the good second look, you know what I mean? You get the sort of second look with people. But what's really cool is when you get in an elevator and the person who gets in is someone who looks just like you. And, you, and then you're like, hey, you know, and it's just, it's really fun. So, especially for kids, I think it's fantastic. And teenagers, it's extremely important. Absolutely. And yeah. so speaking about NAF, I know you yeah. just participated in a research for them. Can yes. you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So again, going back to where we started this conversation, that when I was sitting in the um, dermatologist's office going, where are the psychologists to help with this? Um, ever since then, I've, I've really been interested in that. And so we uh, were able to, uh, working with Dr. Maria Hordinsky at the University of Minnesota, we integrated behavioral health, which is certain sort of mental health services, but it's it's in the dermatology clinic. So they would go into their appointment to see their provider, and then I would ask them if they would want to participate in the research study, and then we randomly, we, put, we randomized some people into a control condition and other people in the treatment condition, but the treatment condition basically consisted of meeting with me as a licensed psychologist to talk to them about, and just ask them two questions, which is, how has alopecia impacted your life? 
And what can we do? What What's the behavioral goal? What's something, barring your hair going back, what could you do to make your life better? And some people would say just the most amazing things, such as, I just wish my adult son would ask me how I'm doing with this. We can, we can work on that. We can't make your hair grow back, but we can certainly, from a psychology perspective, figure out how we can get your, your adult son to ask you. And so those two pieces, we, what we found is just one session. Because we offer people up to two sessions, but most people, just one session was fine. Even though all their scores, like I said, nobody, there was no depression identified. There was no anxiety disorders identified in the group. Um, and only about a third of the people sort of endorse some symptoms on measures, on psychological measures. Almost everybody in the treatment group, they just want, they just needed to talk. They wanted to talk. And they're extremely appreciative of just having that in their dermatology appointment. So it's addressing the psychosocial issues because let's face it, having your hair fall out doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. What hurts are the psychosocial consequences of your hair falling out. Mm -hmm. So we are trying um, to continue this research and extending it into a pediatric clinic is our next goal, as well as doing a larger extent, because we just did a pilot, but to do a larger study to really try to demonstrate that this is a needed part of treatment for alopecia areata yes. and to integrate it into every dermatologist's office. And then it could expand to beyond just alopecia, but all sorts of skin conditions, any disfiguring skin condition. And what's really cool is that integrated behavioral health care is now a mainstay in dermatology and some of the other specialty care, but not so much in derm. Or did I say derm? I'm sorry, in primary care. It's a mainstay in primary care, as well as some specialty care, but we're really trying to see if we can't move it more to the dermatology world. So it's very exciting. Yes, and it's so needed because I think that part of the problem when you first get diagnosed is that you get a diagnosis and you walk out and that's it. Yeah, right, right. Okay, go, you know, figure it out. Right. And and if you're lucky, your dermatologist will give you a National Alopecia Areata Foundation flyer. If you're lucky. (laughs) If you're lucky. And, um, but even then, sometimes, if especially if you're just starting to lose your hair, sometimes if you, um, to associate and say, like you were saying before, I don't want to have this. I don't be, I don't want to be one of them. So you're not willing to go to that NAF right away because that means you have to, you don't want to join that because you don't want to be in that party. <laughs> you don't want to be on that dream. And so um, it's even more isolating sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, I think it's extremely important. And I also believe, or at least for myself, but I've also talked to many other patients who've endorsed this as well. When you're sitting there in a dermatologist's office, you are so emotionally raw because not only are you having to show your head and your hair loss to complete strangers, but you're hoping for a treatment and you're just, it's like a scab. It doesn't take much to pick at it and it's going to start bleeding. And so the emotions are really, really high. And, um, you know, some people are great. Some people have accepted it and they've come with it and they're still getting treatment, but other people, it can be pretty raw. And so to have someone there just to help you talk with it can, at least the research results are saying it's very important. And even though we had a small, um, it wasn't statistically significant because it was a small sample size, we did a one month Mm follow-up and all the confidence intervals and effect sizes said that we're moving in the right direction. So we have hints that it it does work. We just need to do a larger sample size to really, to prove it or to demonstrate it statistically. That one month later, you are better, the people who had this treatment are better than the people who didn't have it in terms of psychological functioning. So it's pretty cool. If if there is one thing that we can do, yeah, uh, you know, what would that be? What do you think is like the the one thing that we should do once we're diagnosed or you know, if we're having a hard time? Sure, sure. Find people with whom you can talk about it. Don't hide it. Or at least don't hide it from everybody. Find someone who will let you vent, someone who's gonna say, Well, you can just wear a wig or you're not gonna die from it. That's not really helpful. Because we know that mm-hmm. it's, it, there's, it's a grieving process. Mm-hmm. You have to grieve it and it's a process. So you need people to help you with that. So reach out to other people. If you don't have those other people, reach out to NAF yes. and you don't have to be in a large you know, support group meeting. They'll help you find a one-on-one person that can talk with you and listen to you. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the most important thing and talk to your provider, really talk to your provider about what it is how you're feeling about the emotions. emotions. Yes. 
I think uh, it that's so important to allow ourselves to feel our feelings because um, I also think there's a lot of guilt around, um, you know, I'm not having a terminal illness. It's just right, weird. right. It's right. not here because it affects all the things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. The other thing is too, and I just want to mention it quickly, is that we've been talking all about the patient, but this affects kids as well. And because it affects kids, it affects parents. And even with adults, it affects the partners of the adults. And we have lots of research out there too that the quality of life of parents and partners are just as in, are highly impacted due to the alopecia. So it's really, if a person in that family gets alopecia, I say they all get it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, fun fact, well, which is probably not fun, but it wasn't until... I started doing this summit right now that I was had a conversation with my mom because throughout my journey, I, you know, she was always supporting me, supporting me, supporting me, supporting me, but I never got to talk to her about what was it like for her. Right. Right. And so recently she said, she said, you know what? I've been praying that I will lose my hair so you will get it back. And now I see why this happened. So you could guide other people throughout this. So you had a mission and it's okay. And I just looked at her like, oh my God, mom, like, were you in pain? And then she starts like sharing all the pain that she this has been through. And Absolutely. it just, it broke my heart to, to right. learn that because I never, it never even crossed my mind. You know, I was in so much pain that I never thought that she was Right. In pain. Right. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So. It, it's well, very real for, for all the family members. Absolutely. For everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Christina, so yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. I love this interview. Uh, this is, I mean, this is fascinating to me, and I want nothing but to continue supporting this cause in any yep. way. Yeah. Um, so, yes. I mean, we'll definitely stay in touch. I know I'll see you again, hopefully yes. at the half conference. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. So <laughs> if any of you go or if it, we invite you to come, right? Yeah. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah, no, it's it's really wonderful. And if anybody happens to go there and you see me walking around, shout out. So I'd love to I'd love yeah. All right. All right. Thank you so much and right. everybody, I'll see you in the next interview. Okay. Bye.